Thank you, Pastor Tim. It's a great honor to be here. I'm excited. I've uh, been very excited about uh, coming. And I've been here before, not in this auditorium, uh, but I've been to the other church. And I think I gave a little testimony a couple years ago. And uh, I'm excited to see what God is doing in your church. Yesterday, Jacob and Taylor drove me up to the new property. And uh, we planned on driving up to the building, but there was a whole bunch of mounds there, I guess, probably a good thing that keeps people from driving up in there. Um, but we climbed over it and made it up to the building, and I'm very, very excited about your future uh, to see what God has done here in just a few years and with your pastor, the staff, and with you, dedicated people, desiring to serve God. And you're just a testimony not just among your own community and the surrounding community, but you are a great testimony to the world of what can be done. Now, your, your pastor has tremendous amount of talent, but he's not perfect. And uh, he revealed some of his sin. I'm, I'm anxious to have lunch with him, and maybe he'll reveal a few other faults that he has. I, I don't know. It could be. I haven't noticed many in them, uh, but I have learned to love your pastor. And uh, so glad for my oldest grandchild that's uh, able to be here and a member of this church. And uh, his mother, his mother was born in Mexico City when we lived there, starting a church. And, um, well, you know, back then we didn't have a credit card and we had checks, but nobody would take a check unless you would wait 10 days for it to, to clear. And <clears throat> um, Tammy came early. And so I was, she was supposed to come at the end of the month when I got paid and when I'd have the money to pay the bill. So uh, she came early, not, not too early, but but early enough to cause us problems. And uh, she has caused us a lot of problems since then. But anyway, that's another story. So Connie went to the hospital and, um, and gave birth to this beautiful, gorgeous baby. And she was the only um, American baby in that hospital. And all, everybody would look at her and say, wow, look at the baby. And she was, she was beautiful. Uh, but the administration called me down to the office, and it was time for us to leave, and the office said, uh, Mr. Zeiner, you have not paid your bill. I said, I know. I said, I'm going to do it uh, at the end of the month. And they said, well, that's fine, but you don't understand. Uh, your wife can leave, but the baby has to stay until the bill's paid. Now, how am I, how am I going to explain this to Connie? We're going home, but we're leaving the baby here at the hospital. That's not going to work. So I went up to the, uh, to the room, and I said, Connie, we got a problem. He, she said, you know, my wife is very smart. She said, no, you have a problem. <laughs> she said, I'm not leaving here without Tammy. I said, okay. Man, I, uh, we had led this couple, retired teacher, to the Lord, and they were coming to our church. And I went to them and asked them, told them the situation, asked them that if they could cash a check for us. And they said, oh, pastor, sure, we would love to do that. I said, well, I need the second thing from you. Well, what's that? Could you hold the check till the end of the month? <laughs> Don't try to deposit it because the money's not in the bank. And they did, and we were able to bring our precious little uh, baby home from the hospital. And so God has blessed my family abundantly, more than we ever deserve. I was 23 years of age, and Connie was 21, with two little babies, our two oldest, Steve and Tim, when we moved to Mexico. Very little knowledge, uh, but we had a tremendous amount of zeal and desire to serve God. And I guess I was dumb enough, stupid enough to, to, to do those things, not thinking of the consequences, but God truly, truly blessed us and watched our steps 
and trained with an uh, American missionary for uh, a tremendous veteran missionary for two years. And then we went out on our own to start our churches after language school and training. And for 26 years, God has blessed us abundantly with starting churches in Medi the Yucatan, Mexico City, um, all over the state of uh, several places in Durango, Chihuahua. And what a joy it has been to do that, to train pastors. The pastor said that those churches are surviving or something like that. We do have churches that never made it. And, uh, you know, we always want to report the positive things. I mean, that's, we want to be positive. But there are places where Paul went where he could do no work. And there were places where we went where the people did not have a mind to work. But we've been to other places where the people had a mind to work, and they allowed God to work through them and to do a great work. And now those churches, many of them have supported, uh, uh, supported new works and started. One church, the church we started in Mexico City, the first church that we started failed. The second church that we started, God blessed it and prospered it. And we led a young man to Christ, and... Uh, God used that young man, and he grew up, became an evangelist, and then he became a church planner, and he has started churches in multiple cities. And uh, several years ago, he, he invited me to come back and to dedicate one of those church plants. What a joy that was to see this young man, now an adult, and uh, pastoring at these churches. And so God will bless if you will be faithful. Well, this is mission emphasis number three, I believe, of this month. And I uh, hope that I can be a blessing and an inspiration to you and a challenge to you, give you a little bit of instruction and help in this area. <clears throat> yes, there are 7,000 plus languages on the face of the earth. And uh, over 2,800, now think about it, of those languages do not have one single verse of Scripture translated. This used to be one of those, the Isan of Northeast Thailand. 26 million people speak this language. This language group was one of the was the <clears throat> largest Bibleist group of people in the world. <clears throat> Twenty six that million never had the scripture. Now they have a New Testament in their language. What a joy! Well, brother Steve, what did they use before that? Well, they used the Thai Bible, but the Thai language was not their mother tongue. They they understood it for trade reasons and a little bit of that nature because they lived in Thailand but this is a tribal language and this is their mother tongue and now they had God's words in their mother language that they could fully understand and perceive and receive and what a joy it was to receive them receive that this is another translation that is just about ready to be printed in Thailand uh, in uh, India over 100 million people speak the Telugu uh, language. And the Bible has been completed. And now they're doing the finishing touches on, on it. We have the funds to be able to print that. And I think underneath my chair, Jacob, underneath my chair, do I, did I leave something there? Well, I must have. Now, now you're going to have to go to my table. Um, Nobody came to my table. Pastor, nobody. Well, the pastor did. He came to my table to get me and take me someplace else. But please come to my table. We just finished the Zwahili, John and Romans. It's a bilingual Zwahili English. And uh, over a, around 100 million people speak this largest tribal language of Africa. In Africa, there are over 2,000 languages. I think 2,200 plus languages. And many of them do not have uh, God's word in their language. 
A missionary prays to duplicate himself. That's the missionary's desire. And um, I think that's your desire, to duplicate this church or to duplicate your life. You're saved. You're born again. You know Christ as your Savior. You want to duplicate in the li- that in the lives of others. And I think the church also wants to duplicate, create more churches uh, of like faith. And so the missionary, it's no different. The missionary goes to the foreign field, and his desire is to work himself out of a job. He wants to duplicate himself in the lives of those people. Now, he goes with a great burden, a great desire. For me, 23 years of age, with all of that burden, all of that desire, uh, I thought it would be advantageous if I could be Mexican, look like a Mexican, talk like a Mexican, and act like a Mexican. Well, the good things act. I didn't want to do all the things the Mexicans did. So I thought about, I did have hair back then, and I was going to, I told Connie, I said, I want to dye my hair black, because all Mexicans have black hair, except the older ones, they have gray hair. Now, now I could be a true Mexican. Some of them are bald and gray. And so I wanted to dye my hair. Could you imagine my skin color with black hair? It just, it wouldn't go. And then I called Brother Keen up. I told my pastor, I said, preacher, after being there about a year, I said, uh, I want to do something. He said, what do you want to do, Steve? I said, I, I want to renounce my citizenship and I want to become a Mexican citizen. You what? I said, yeah. Why would you want to do that? I said, I don't know, preacher. I said, I, I just feel I want to be part of these people that God has called us to minister to. And I think that if I were a Mexican, I, I would have an advantage. He said, he didn't tell me no. He said, Steve, would you just pray about it a little while and before you make that decision? I said, okay. And so when I went to language school, I said, well, I want to speak just like a Mexican. I, I studied really hard, really, really, really hard. And I really worked at it. Now, why did I want to do that? Because that was my heart's desire. I thought that these tools, these things that, that I possessed that could help me reach them more. But it wasn't long that I learned something. It wasn't my looks. It wasn't my speech. It was one single thing. It was my heart. And that's what captured the Mexican people. They saw my tears and they saw our heart. That we genuinely loved them and carried the good news of the gospel to them. No one from Mexico asked us to come. Matter of fact, they told us they didn't need us. But after we went and won them to Christ, they said, thank you, missionary. Thank you, churches, for sending someone to bring the good news of the gospel to us. So Mexico and the Philippines are two of the countries in our world today that have a great number of very strong churches because of the church in the United States, sending out missionaries to those two countries. They're probably the most evangelized, though there's still great need. Well, what do you mean? When we went, there were 50 million people. There are over 130 million people in Mexico today. So it's, there's a tremendous need. So I want to talk to you this morning briefly about the crisis of missions, the crisis of missions. I hope that you will understand. I heard this story about a man who had an exceptional dog, unbelievable dog. This dog could walk on water. Never seen a dog like that. He he thought this dog was great. He went down to the waterfront, and there was a man sitting over there, and uh, He uh, took his dog out there, and he saw that man. He said, boy, watch this. That man's going to be really impressed with this. So he he took a stick and threw it out in the water, and that dog 
ran out after that stick into the water, right on top of the water, picked up the stick and came back. And he looked over the man, and the man seemed to be not impressed. Well, I'll do it again. Threw it out there again. Uh, man, I almost said otra vez. I don't know why. Spanish is coming in here. Uh, again, he walked on the water, picked up that stick, and brought it back. The guy didn't move. He did it the third time. Same scenario. Finally, he was upset with that man that he was not impressed with his dog that could walk on water. He went over there. Sir, did you see what my dog did? Yeah. Are you impressed with that? No. Well, why aren't you impressed with it? He said, what's wrong with your dog? What do you mean what's wrong with my dog? He said, can't your dog swim? <laughs> now, my point with that story is, I want you to understand I want you to perceive. I want you to fully understand and be able to discern that God has a message. God has something for you today. And I hope that when you walk out these doors and you go home, you say, wow, I never thought about that before. I mean, we all know that God has called the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <clears throat> I hope that you know that. And if God has called us to do that, we really don't have a choice. We do have a choice, but, but as the children of God, we ought to be obedient to him to fulfill that great commission. So he's given us story after story in the word of God to enforce and, or to uh, help us to understand that. Faith promise giving or missionary giving or grace giving to take the gospel to the ends of the earth starts with us giving ourselves. That's what Connie and I did. God, here, are, here we are. We give ourselves to you. And God called us into the ministry. Paul speaking to the church that he started in Corinthians. And turn with, my, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, let me read this verse. Paul says to the, the church at Corinth, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now this is a church that Paul started. He went to them preaching the gospel. He said in, in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, the reason why he came, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The reason I came to you was not to receive money from you, not to receive a salary from you, because he took no funds from that church. The church at Philippi and others, the churches of Macedonia, were supplying missionary fund and even... Uh, Paul, when he arrived at Corinth, uh, he started, because he was a tent maker, started working to make funds so that he could live. He did not want to be accountable to them in that area of finances. It was a wealthy church, and he wanted them to know, I'm not coming to you to get something from you. I'm uh, financially, I'm coming to you to tell you about Christ. And all I want to know of you is that you know him, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. That was the most important part in Paul's ministry with this church at Corinth. Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. I've been to Thailand I've seen the Buddhist temples. I've been to China and seen the atheism that's there. I've been to India and tried to minister to the Hindus. I've been to many different places around this world. But Jesus said, and we think about how can we reach these people that have been raised up as a little child in Hinduism or Buddhism or Catholicism or whatever religion there is, how can we reach them with the gospel? Jesus said, 
that if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's the message, Pastor Tim. That's the message that we took as missionaries. Lift up Christ. That's what they're doing in Detroit. They're lifting up the name of Christ, Jesus. And so now that's a promise of God. We claim that promise promise. So everywhere we go, everywhere Paul went, he preached Jesus. Paul went to this church. He was there 18 months. Great sin was in this church, and Paul had to deal with it, and he wrote first the letter of 1 Corinthians to them. And he writes in 2 Corinthians, again, he addresses this issue, not knowing that they had rectified the situation. He is hoping that things are going well, but hears that Judaizers, false teachers, had entered into the work that he started and was causing great disruption. They were accusing Paul that he really wasn't an apostle. And so they were tearing down the character of Paul, and Paul was defending himself in this letter to the church at Corinth, convincing them, trying to convince them, that he had genuine and true love and that he was a true apostle of God. These false teachers began to attack Paul and his authority. Paul deals with it with the proof of his love, the evidence of his apostleship, and examples of his devotion to them and his call to the ministry. He writes as a loving pastor trying to help those that he had pointed to Christ. He tells them in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and 5, and boy, these are harsh words. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Wow, that's pretty tough, isn't it? Are you really saved? Are you really born again, Paul is saying? Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. If you're born again, Christ lives in you. And if not, what did he say? Except ye be reptobates. Either you're born again or 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 you're lost. And so Paul is dealing with this. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where I want to share with you today. In the midst of all of that, that letter... The first seven chapters and then 10 through 13 deals with this apostleship. We find 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And in those two chapters, we find a great deal that deals with Christian giving and the principles of Christian giving. Now, all through the Bible, God deals with the subject of giving. All through the Bible, we hear about Uh, how we're to give, and uh, he gives this illustration. I mean, all through the Old Testament, he gives this illustration of of great things that he has done uh, to supply. Hasn't God always supplied for us? He has for for our family. Uh, We see examples of Elijah with the widow woman of Zarephath, the widow of Zarephath, how that God supplied through her, Elisha, Uh, John chapter 6, the feeding uh, of the 5,000, how the God supplied and told the disciples, I want you to give unto them. And the disciples said, wow, how could we do that? We only have five barley loaves and two small fishes. And Jesus, you want us to feed the multitude? So when God calls the missionary to the foreign field, whether it be Mexico or Thailand, the missionary looks at himself and he said, God, I don't even speak the language. How am I going to minister to all these people? You just lift Christ up. You do what you're supposed to do. Learn the language. I will draw these people. And I'm here, one, to tell you that in 52 years of the ministry, God has done that. And if we had the time, I could give you the evidence of how he's done that. And so there's four things very quickly, I want you to see about these two chapters. First of all, we find the illustration of Christian giving. And that's the, the example of Christian giving. He uses these Macedonians. 
Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, read with me. Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing to themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. We have three examples of giving in these two chapters. One is by the Macedonians. There isn't anyone here that could legitimately say, I can't give. Not a one. Because there's no one here that is as poor as those Macedonians out of their deep poverty gave. And so we know that God used them as an example, and then Jesus as an example. Uh, Paul tells the Corinthian church, Jesus gave his life so that you could have eternal life. And then the other is God. He gave a wonderful gift to us, and that was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the illustration of Christian giving. The New Testament church saw great God, saw giving as a grace. It was a real blessing. God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. That's a quote by Hudson Taylor, missionary to China. God will always supply. Now today, yesterday, uh, my family knows very well that my wife started cooking her meal. Friday, she starts buying it. And there better be money, Pastor Tim, there better be money in the bank account because she's going to go to the store and she's going to use the credit card. Well, she doesn't care if there's any money in the bank or not because she's going to use the credit card. And she's going to go to the store and she's going to spend whatever she wants to spend on that Sunday meal. And when I say whatever she wants to spend, if I ever go with her, sometimes I go with her on Friday and I find there's something a little cheaper here, I don't want that. Well, honey, it's the same. Did you hear what I said? I don't want that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> then I try again. It's not long. I walk away and go look at the tools and look at stuff and let her do her shopping because she's going to buy what she wants. Saturday morning, she starts that preparation for that meal. And uh, I called her this morning early. She said, I can't talk. I I'm getting everything ready before I go to church. Okay. Goodbye. And... Then she calls me back later. I don't mess with anything about her Sunday meal. I think last Sunday, was it last Sunday or the Sunday before, we had like 23 of our grandchildren, our children, and then sometimes they bring some, guests, uh, uh, some visitors. And it's a, it's, a, it's a golden corral. It isn't just one thing. She makes a banana, banana pudding, but you can't just make banana pudding the normal way. She does make it the normal way. But we have three or four kids. Jacob, are you one of them that don't like bananas in it? So I have a couple grandkids that don't like the bananas in the banana pudding. So in the refrigerator, you'd open them. And here's all these saucers with just pudding in it and whipped cream on top. I, I don't know. Do our grandkids not know how to take the bananas out and throw them away? And I, I, don't, I don't get that. But I don't say anything to Connie. Now, I... She will be the last one to eat on Sunday morning. And it brings her great joy and great happiness. And it's a tradition for her. She, she just thanks God that she's able to do this for her family. It is a true act of love. Now, Pastor Tim, I'm getting older. And I'm trying to think of some things that I could do for my kids and grandkids because I think I want to die real soon. And I don't think they'll remember much about me. But they're going to remember Nana real well, okay? She's going to have all the accolades. They're always going to remember him. Oh, yeah, she, yeah, Papa, yeah, he was there eating too. Yeah, that's, that's all I get. They don't realize I paid for all of this stuff. 
Don't say that either because she'll say, oh, so this is your money and not my. Okay, we won't go there. So the illustration, the illustration is she does it out of great love. That's what those Macedonians did. They had tremendous love. That's what a missionary does when he goes to the, to the foreign field. He has such great love. It doesn't matter. He takes his family there. Uh, he doesn't always look at it as suffering or an inconvenience. He looks at it as a great joy, a great privilege that I get to take the gospel to another place. That's how I look at the ministry. God's Every once in a while when I'm in an airplane and... Uh, uh, they upgrade me to first class. I don't know if you've ever been to first class in an overseas flight. Flight. I mean, it makes into a bed. You've got your own little, wow! I mean, I want to fly like this everywhere, you know? And, but it doesn't happen. But every once in a while, because I fly so much, they'll upgrade me. And I'll sit there and I'll think, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I need to be on a boat somewhere, taking me months to get to someplace suffering. I, I count it a great privilege to serve him. So God gives us that illustration of the Macedonians. Then he gives us inspiration in Christian giving, exhortation. He says in verse 7, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. And so all of those things, faith, utterance, uh, the word spoken, knowledge, diligence, love, see that you abound in this grace also of giving. Don't be afraid to give. And so he gives us the example, uh, the, uh, the illustration. He gives us the inspiration. We have all eternity to celebrate our victories. But only one short hour before sunset in which to win them. Robert Moffat, translator to Africa. That's what the missionaries thought. I have such a little time left to minister, and they ministered with all of their hearts. You and I will step out of this world one day onto the streets of gold, and we will look back and we will say, why didn't I serve God more? Paul gave two reasons that these, this church was to give. Because of the example of the Macedonians, and then he says, to prove the sincerity of your love. Do you really love Christ? Do you really honor him? Because really, if you do, giving is very easy to give because the object of our love is God, and we want to give to him. When Sister Connie and I were boyfriend and girlfriend, and I worked at my dad's gas station and made a little bit of money, I had absolutely zero problem spending every single dime, every dollar on Connie. Why? Well, first of all, I was going to say first of all because I loved her, and I did love her, but first of all, it's because I was trying to convince her that I was for her, and I was trying to buy her love. So I didn't have any problem of giving everything that I had to her. We would spend hours and hours and hours on the phone. And when we'd hang up, I love you. No, I love you more. I, I mean, it was silly. Just silly. But now when I think on the back, it wasn't so silly. I really liked it. It was, it was enjoyable. And then we got married, and things changed. Anyway. <clears throat> the instruction. He tells us the instruction of Christian giving. The Spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. Henry Martin, missionary to India and Persia and translator of the Holy Scriptures. He reminds them of their promise and their zeal a year early, earlier. This church had made a commitment. We, Paul presented this need. The Macedonians responded to it. 
Uh, Paul told the church at Corinth of what the Macedonians were going to do. And this very rich church, <laughs> hey, we're going to give too. We're going to give likewise. And so maybe Paul thought, wow, they're going to give a great big offering. This church is far more, uh, has far more assets than the Macedonians. Why? They, they're, they're rich. They're probably going to give a hundred times more than the Macedonians. Well, a year go by, went by, and they gave nothing. Zero. And Paul is reminding them, I boasted of you to the Macedonians. I boasted of you to others. Now perform the doing of what you promised. So, so Paul gave them instruction. I think your pastor has given you enough instruction to know that involvement in missions is what God wants us to do. I thank God for your building. I thank God how that God's opened this place for all the things that he's done for you. And it's evident. But never lose sight as you love God, then you're going to love his plan. And his plan is to take his message, the knowledge of Christ, his son that he sent for you and for me to the ends of the earth. The last thing is the involvement. He tells us in chapter 9 in verse 1, he tells them, for, for his touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. He's saying, you should already know this. For I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you, of them of Macedonia. Verse 3, yet I have sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain and in this behalf that as I said ye may be ready lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared he says in verse 6 but this I say he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Does God ever fail in his promises? Never. Every single promise. I might have failed in the promises to my children because I cannot foresee the future. But God knows the future. Every single promise that he gives us in the scripture, he can and he's capable of fulfilling. And this is a promise that God has given to you <clears throat> and, to, and to me. But you see, it's not natural for us to do that. It's natural for a mother to love their child. It's natural for Connie to do all that she can for her children and for her grandchildren. It's just natural for her to do that. It's natural for the father to say, Buy this can because it's cheaper than that can. You get the point? Her love supersedes the love that I could ever give. Though I love my children and I would be willing to die for them. Paul is talking about this type of love. When we love God like we should, then the involvement, the encouragement comes in. And we say, God, here am I. I will be, wow, I hate even thinking about this. In November, I will be 75 years old. I'm old. It just kind of dawned on me. I'm really old. The other day, Connie said, I don't know what we were talking about, something. She said, well, you know, you've only got 10 more years to live. <laughs> well, the doctor doesn't even tell me that. I said, do you know something I don't know? So... I know that I am coming to the end of my life. Who will take my place? I thank God for all the young couples that are in this church. I met some of them last night at a birthday party. And it was encouraging to see them. Now, for me, I, I don't know. I had other motives. Jacob, I, Jacob, I'm sorry. I had other motives than just going to the birthday party. 
I wanted to see those young couples and wonder which one of them are going to surrender to the mission field. <laughs> which one of them are going to take my place? Maybe it's Jacob and Taylor. Well, Jacob said, that's the first I've heard of this. <laughs> I don't know. I have no regrets. I'm not fearful if God calls them into the ministry as missionaries because I've seen how God has taken care of me and I know that God can take care of them. And if he can take care of me and them, he can take care of you. Would you at least consider? Now let me close with this. In Leviticus chapter 23 and verses 10 and 11 Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, during this time of the year, as we celebrate the harvest, they were to go into their harvest field, a great harvest, and they were to take a sheaf and they were to cut some of the fruit, whatever it may be, and bring that out, bind it together, and they were to come out and they were to also wave it before the Lord. They were also to give it to the priest for him to wave that to the Lord. And that was an offering, and that was for several reasons, but one of those was to be reminded that what they brought before the Lord and this great harvest belongs to God. Now, in the New Testament, God talks about Jesus being the first fruit of resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. And so now that Jesus died and he arose from the dead, he is the first fruit of resurrection. What does that mean for us? That means that everybody after him that knows Christ as their Savior will have a resurrection because Jesus arose from the dead. And one day our body will be taken up into heaven and we will have a new body. But what, what does that mean in the application of our message today? As they would take that bits and pieces of that harvest and wave it before the Lord, they couldn't help as they were looking up to look back and to see the whole field full of harvest. And what it meant was there's more to come. There's more to come. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ also looked back to say there's more to come. There's more to come. Let me tell you, God has more to come for you. As you offer your life to Him, Connie and I, before we had children, God, here's our lives. And God blessed us with our, the, our two lives. And we looked back and we thought, there's more to come. Four children came. And now they got married. And now the grandchildren Oh, how God has blessed us. God, here's our tithe. Here's our offering. I don't know, Pastor Tim. Maybe somebody will run through the, offer, uh, through the auditorium and say, here's my tithe. Here's my offering. More to come. More to come. You can count on it because God has blessed us. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt if you're to die right now, you could go to heaven? When I was raised up as a Catholic boy, I didn't know that. I believed in God, believed in Jesus. Wasn't sure if I believed the Bible. I, I never read it. And I see Jesus hanging on the cross every Sunday. Went to Mass. Went to confession every Sunday. Prayed my rosary every day. Went to Catholic school. 
But at nighttime, I said, Steve, where are you going if you were to die right now? I didn't know. Pastor, would you come? I didn't know. And I thought, I'm going to go to hell. And I don't want to go to hell, but I didn't know. Pastor, I didn't know. Nobody told me. And one day, someone gave me the good news. And I listened to that person tell me the true meaning of the death of Christ. Not just hanging on a cross that I would see every Sunday in Mass, but that Jesus shed his blood for me, for my sins. And the penalty of my sins was not three Our Fathers or ten Hail Marys or confession or taking communion or going to Mass every Sunday. You see, I thought, or being good, or that my good works would outweigh my bad works. That's what I thought. But for the first time in my life, I realized, whoa, Jesus died for my sins, and he's given me a gift, and that gift is eternal life. Oh, God, as a 16-year-old boy, I said, I want to be saved. Save me. Come in my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in you as you are the only Savior, nothing else. And my life changed. And now he's the first fruit of resurrection. One day, I will go up in the air with him when he comes back. Or one day when I die, my body will be placed in the grave. And my soul will go to heaven. And when he comes back, my body will rise again from the grave. And I'll have a new body. Oh, that's the blessed hope that God has given us. Pastor.